some assurance of autonomy. So that's the second part, which is a little tricky here, and I'm hopefully get through this with some examples and some ideas of how we'll get there. So the simple idea here is that autonomy is the what that's gonna keep the vehicles efficient and safe, and the assured part is how we're gonna get there. So I wanna give you now the next level down, a sort of a working definition of autonomy. I'm gonna give you three different points of view. I'm gonna give you the roboticist sense of autonomy. So I grew up in the same world as the people who developed Spot as a roboticist, worked on the early ground vehicle. And the robotic sense of autonomy is that there is a sense, act, sorry, sense, plan, act, and interact loop. And this sometimes happens at a sub-second level, and sometimes it has at a 10-second level, and sometimes at an hour level. But there is this continual sense of the environment, of the internal state, make a plan or replan, and then execute that plan, interact with an operator or uh, interact with another vehicle. The aerospace engineer's view of autonomy is that it's the outer loop over stability control. Stability control keeps the vehicle in place, going in a particular direction, and then autonomy is the outer loop that guides the vehicle. Now the regulator's view of autonomy is dealing with the off-nominal. All the things that you didn't think about, all the things that could go wrong are what you think about is we call that off-nominal. So again, very informal ways of thinking about autonomy, nothing like the standards would have you, but this is what we work with on a daily basis to think about what autonomy might do. Now, <clears throat> let's take it one level further down in terms of abstraction. At Near Earth, we've been thinking about what it actually takes, the fundamental capabilities that it takes for a vehicle to fly safely and efficiently. From before the vehicle takes off to the time it lands. And there are seven capabilities. I'll just walk you through these very quickly to give you a sense of these fundamental capabilities. They look differently for different kinds of aircraft, but there are seven of them. So this mission planning that takes all the possible information and uses it to plan a path, keeping the vehicle safe and efficient. There's uh, obstacle avoidance, avoiding anything that's not on its map that it might intersect with, avoiding other aircraft while it's flying from A to B, Flying without GPS is a very big deal because if GPS is either jammed or degraded, we know all kinds of problems will occur. In fact, a lot of aircraft that are flying today would come down very rapidly if somehow or the other GPS were degraded or completely went away, even for a short period of time. So that's a thing that we will worry about. This is a GPS-free navigation or GPS-denied navigation, some people call it. And then contingency management is about actually dealing with all the things that might go wrong, something on the vehicle, that uh, failed, a propulsion system, fuel system that might fail. Um, it's not easy to pull over when you're flying. So we wanna think about how to accomplish that uh, in terms of these vehicles. Precision landing is about making sure you land very, very precisely and surely where you're supposed to. And then safe landing is about actually uh, making sure that when you remove the pilot, vehicle stole, land somewhere, then it can do, the vehicle itself does what you expect it to do, which is to land safely. So these are fundamental capabilities. I'm just gonna boil this down into four things, okay? We call this in plain speak, we want to develop technology that enables vehicles to fly safe, land safe, do without GPS, even when things go wrong. So what I wanna do now is I wanna give you a very quick examples, so this doesn't stay very dry, of fly safe, land safe, do it without GPS, even when things go wrong, for a variety of vehicles. If I'm doing my job properly and saying these things are some fundamental capabilities, we should do them, be able to do them at different scales, meter scale, full uh, helicopter size scale, um, different kinds of propulsions, methods, et cetera. So let's see if I can do that. Okay, so here's fly safe. Here's a, a vehicle that is flying through a tunnel, inspecting the tunnel for various kinds of things that might be happening in the tunnel. And what we see here is that there's some piece of equipment that just happens to be in its path. And just like spot being directed at the chair, it should not skip a beat. 
It should continue, and you can see on the right, that is a completely autonomous vehicle. It saw that crane in the middle that wasn't expecting, uh, dodged that crane and kept going. And in fact, when it came back, it, it took a slightly different path when it came back, but it wasn't programmed to do it. There was no GPS, there was no infrastructure there. There was no map created ahead of time. It was job was go inspect the tunnel and, and it, it did that. So that's at a small scale, okay? And here's another one at the scale of a small drone that's inspecting a, a, a facility. We know that wires are a big deal. Um, here it is. There's a wire in its way. It detects the wire and it just keeps on going. It plans a path without missing a beat, doesn't stop or anything else like this, doesn't slam into it. And this is a playback of a real video, <clears throat> real uh, flight in an industrial complex. But we should be able to do this at a much larger scale too. So here's a large helicopter site, in fact, a helicopter that can carry five to 6,000 pounds um, flying. And when it is flying close to the ground in, for whatever reason, if it's doing this kind of uh, operation, uh, it needs to be able to have sensors on board to be able to form a representation so it makes sure that it can stay clear of these things. So this is, these are examples of fly safe at different scales. Land safe is a very easy way to think, uh, think about it. Here's a very complex scene. Supposing uh, this is your summer retreat and you want your flying taxi to come get you and it's been told, hey, go land in this place. It's a particularly complex place. Uh, there's trees, there's uh, water, there's uh, bushes, there's even a truck parked there and even a Pelican case here. So you want your flying taxi in the worst case, whether it's doing an emergency landing or it's coming to get you, uh, take you back to work, to be able to land in this place and to be able to land safely. So here, here's uh, an actual flight into this environment. Uh, this is a nose cam view of the kind of sensor data that the aircraft is a full-scale helicopter landing here. Uh, builds of that environment is able to then look for places that are dangerous, water, vegetation, and then select uh, a landing point that is level, smooth, and obstacle-free. Okay, so we did land safe. Uh, here's another instance of that. This is a very interesting aircraft. It's got wings and it's got rotors too, hybrid VTOL we call it, with our uh, friends from Latitude and then some work with the Army uh, to do blood delivery, whole blood delivery over long distances. Um, here's a vehicle taking off. It's gonna fly a long distance. Um, you can get a sense of what it looks like. It's coming into a landing place, but alas, there happens to be something parked right there where it's been told to land, and it's going to recognize that and back up so to speak, and land. So this is a data view. It's got sensors on board. It uh, detects that the place we've been told to land is not a good place to land and backs up and lands in a place that's safe to land. So more land safe. Now let's talk about do it without GPS. Well, do it without GPS is a tricky thing because there is not a simple monolithic solution to that. There are two cases which are fairly straightforward now. Now we technology has been going Either you're flying very high or you're flying very low. When you're flying very high, you have a sense of uh, terrain. There's some invariance, depending on the, irrespective of the weather, you can sense it and you can make any kind of corrections if GPS is degraded. So to push this, we took a, did a flight, 140 miles, 225 kilometers, flying around 1,500 to 2,000 feet from Ashtabula to Zanesville. I was asking for Allentown to Zelianople. You'll figure out why I was looking for these, uh, this kind of a naming scheme. But what uh, we wanted to do was to fly completely without GPS once you take off and land. After uh, flying for um, about an hour or so, hour and a half, we land less than 100 meters away. No GPS at all. Now, the other easy thing or is doable today is this thing where you're flying in an area that has been mapped like a warrant of tunnels or indoors or any kind of industrial plant. You can make a map. Um, you can do a 10 kilometer flight easily maintaining better than 10 centimeter kind of error. Okay, so there is a slightly different kind of a challenge when we're dealing with 
uh, the altitudes relevant to urban air mobility. And here's a case, 18 kilometers flying at only 150 feet. Now you've got a little bit closer view of the ground. You're flying over urban areas, fields, rivers, that kind of thing. And to give you a quick view, this is Google Earth's view of a uh, nav system that we put on a helicopter and flew it 18 kilometers from one airfield to the other, flying very low. And uh, now we're gonna see what, what happens. So again, no GPS after we take off. And after 18 kilometers, we're about two football fields lengths away if we're just using visual odometry plus IMU. Um, and if we're actually getting matches from the terrain, either from a visual map or from the actual terrain profile itself, you're as low as 10 meters away at the end, okay? So there isn't a single solution here. And of course, much work needs to be done to make this invariant to night and weather conditions, et cetera. But I think these, these are somewhat in hand. There's another thing about when things go wrong. Um, and here's a case where we wanna be able to plan for something like a battery failure. So what you have here is a case that there's a fire on board and the vehicle has to quickly be able to land and the idea is you don't wait till one of these things happens, but in fact, the entire path is planned such that at all moments you have this idea of where you're going to land if there is a problem. Here, uh, where will I land? I go a few meters, where will I land if there's a problem? And you can see that this kind of a thing, you can trigger a landing and it'll land here. So now I want to switch gears a little bit. I wanna talk about the assurance part, not about the autonomy part. I spent a lot of time doing that. And the key idea here is there's a large number of stakeholders in this assurance part, okay? There's users, there's operators, investors, regulators, insurers, and developers. They're all looking for some version of trust before they put their money or they put their kid or they put themselves or their cargo in one of these, these vehicles of the future. There's a little bit of a distinction that some of them are gonna care more about the safety through autonomy, and some of them are gonna care more about the assurance of autonomy, so that the autonomy itself will, will work for sure and it won't do something bad. But really, actually, this is all about trust. Okay, so if we're gonna be about trust, how we're gonna do this? So this is how we actually build our technology. We say that technology must be capable, it must be robust, must fail safely, and improve continuously. Capable means it should be able to do the kinds of things we've talked about, the things that were planned in the CONOPS. Be robust means be able to deal with conditions that are not nominal, okay? Uh, fail safely is if something goes wrong, you wanna make sure that these vehicles will, will be able to degrade gracefully and do the right thing even as they're failing. And then improve continuously has to do with actually making sure that the vehicles are getting better over time. So we can get some inspiration from the self-driving car tech world. They've got a lot of money behind them, a lot of work behind them. And so some of this, this thinking comes from that world and we can see how we can graft some of that into our world. I'm gonna sort of boil this down here. Our philosophy when you build technology uh, for, for such that you build trustworthy systems, what you, what you wanna do is you wanna do the right thing, which is making sure you've got the right requirements and you're gonna test this correctly, not just something that has these components certified to some standard, and then you wanna do it right, which is a, a lot about actually following some process. So I wanna give you an idea, just before I sort of wind down here, about how we're gonna produce these safety assured systems. So today we have some standards for what I'll call certified assurance. These are standard methods like DO-178, DO-254 for hardware and software. And certainly there are components that are, that can actually go that route, okay? So if we have software uh, that are basically trying to code some ordered algorithm, then we can verify this algorithm offline and follow this path of certified assurance. Same with hardware, we've got some tried and tested methods to do that. The problem is that these are not going to get us where we want. So we've got a couple of other classes of assurance that we need to care about. So the first kind of thing we want to look at is complex algorithms 
that cannot be certified offline. What we can do is we can build watchdogs that can be certified online or offline so that they always do the right thing. So the idea here is that I might not be able to certify an obstacle detection algorithm, but I might be able to certify the watchdog that makes sure that it's doing the right thing. We call that runtime assurance. Okay. There's another set of things that are another set of technologies that are coming from the self-driving car world, which are complex. They have sensors that just basically are never going to meet the, uh, the hardware methods that are, have been used in the past for aviation. And there are going to be algorithms that are going to be extremely hard to do any kind of online or offline certification. And we'll call these things emerging assurance paradigms. And for these, we're going to lean to the uh, self-driving car world. So <clears throat> let's think about this. Certified assurance is here today. DO 178, DO uh, 254. Runtime assurance is coming very, very soon, coming to a regulator very close to you. This is the ASTM standard, the 3679, or maybe I've got this thing, the number is slightly wrong. Uh, we'll call this runtime. And then the emerging assurance paradigms are just what's coming next, very soon. So blue for what's here today, orange for what's coming next, and gray for sometime soon. Okay, I want you to remember that because I'm going to show you uh, something here that will become important. So let's see if we can map this to what we've been doing. We've talked about seven kinds of capabilities. Turns out that there isn't one time, one kind of mission planning or one kind of obstacle avoidance because, as you would imagine, the con ops are going to be different for different kinds of missions. Different con ops and different kinds of requirements. And so we, we don't have to think about every one of them as a bespoke solution. We can think of classes of solutions. So it turns out we have, these aren't just things here, three kinds of mission planning uh, three kinds of obstacle avoidance that we've been looking at, and so on and so forth. And so the idea is, how does this map into the, to what we've been talking about? Certification standards that are here today, certification standards that are coming, or very, very soon, the ASTM standard, for example, the runtime assurance, and then the next generation of certification that we're going to steal from the self-driving car world. So that's this, and then a way to think about this is, if you add those up, we have 23 different modules. This is just one company's view of it. Uh, but since we deal with the industry quite broadly with all kinds of different aircraft, I'm going to suggest to you that a lot of what we can do, what is necessary today, can be done with certified assurance. There's a whole other th set that we can do with the runtime assurance, and then there's going to be this extra level, the most complex things which you're looking for that will be done with these emerging standards that we're going to steal from the self-driving car world. I love that. Okay, takeaways. So our short autonomy is really about trust, right? We've got a large number of stakeholders, and it's not just the regulators, and it's not just the investors, it's like everybody. It's the users. It's the coders. They all have to be on board for this idea of a short autonomy. All right? Autonomy uses some understanding of the environment and vehicle health to accomplish a mission. So that's the easy way to think about what autonomy is. Okay? Um, assurance comes from doing a good mix of doing the right thing and doing it right. Doing the right thing has to do with setting the requirements right, not just thinking about a particular standard, because a particular standard that we have just assures that it can do a certain thing, but doing the right thing, making sure it's the world is set up for this, or the whole development cycle is set up. There's a continuous um, improvement cycle that's transparent, and there is some way to explain what happened. This whole thing is all about doing the right thing and then doing it right. And finally, I'm going to claim that much of the assurance we're looking for can be done by a combination of certification that's here today, the, the standards that are here today, and then also runtime assurance, which is the thing that's coming next. So I'm going to stop there.